speaking off camera, I am Elizabeth Melton, Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute Conference Room in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Thursday, June 1st, 2023, and I am joined by Harold Morales. Harold, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, my name is Harold Morales. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents were part of the Assemblies of God. My grandpa, grandparents were also part of the Assemblies of God um, from Central America. And a lot of those experiences, like diaspora experiences in LA, um, in the particular communities that I was situated in, um, has, have informed my interest in religious studies um, and academia in, in, in general. Um, yeah, so my research has been on uh, Latin and Muslim organizations in the United States, um, identity politics, and the kind of in-between spaces between lived experiences and the mediation of those experiences, so communication and things like that. Um, also, I love teaching. Um, I, I like sharing the kind of sense of awe and inspiration that I get when reading cool things and um, meeting new people and checking out new spots. Um, it's a really cool vibe, really great energy for me, and I love sharing that with students, and I learn a lot from them as well. Um, so it's a, a big passion of mine, uh, in both in terms of like the subject area and the kinds of questions that I get to pursue and think about and talk to people about, but also just, yeah, the kinds of um, conversation partners that I get to be around. Um, it's pretty, pretty neat. So I've been teaching for, for uh, over a decade now at Morgan State um, and IUP and a couple of other places. Um, and it was part of that teaching that I wanted to connect students to those cool experiences, um, taking them to different field trips, inviting guest speakers, working with activists, um, figuring out assignments where students could learn more about civic engagement, could learn more about community engaged work. Um, that kind of led to the outgrowth of the center. So like, I was doing a lot of the things by myself with little funding, um, paying out of pocket for students' meals and travel expenses and entrance into museums when they couldn't. Um, and so like I reached out to a couple of people, wrote some grants, and I'm grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation for all the support they provided um, and was able to kind of scale up but also do the thing without like stretching myself so thin. Um, and it's been a lot of learning experiences, but yeah, so that's a little bit about how I got to this place. That's awesome, thank you. Um, so with the the center, right, is the Center for Religion in the city, in cities? Center, yeah, it originally was the Center for the Study of Religion, um, religion and, uh, and the city. And then I was thinking about it as like this kind of um, theoretical concept, uh, the, the way that we theorize religion in the academy itself, um, that it's not like a, a specific thing, but it emerges out of a lot of, um, yeah, analytic conversations. So I was like, okay, cool. So let's do that with the city as well um, and be playful and creative in terms of what it could mean. Um, and so for myself, like, I think I kept coming back to the city as a place of, as a site of injustices. And it was kind of the space that I was in at the moment. So it's like, um, out of 2015 is where I like felt this sense of desperation um, uh, during the Baltimore uprisings after the death of um, Freddie Gray. Um, uh, at, at the hands of um, police violence. And I got to this place where I wanted to like engage the city in creative ways, but then because of the space that I was in and emotionally, but also in, in terms of the city and what was going on, I kept coming back to the city as, um, as a site of, primarily as a site of injustices for black and brown folks in particular. Um, and so that kind of shaped a lot of the work that we did with the center around social justice um, movements and issues. And there's so much more to religion and cities. Um, it's just that, that that was the place that I was at um, and, and largely continue to be, um, though with help from, from others, have um, started to lean into other ways of thinking about the city as well. Uh, so, and we've dropped the research part from the name of the, the center. So it's not um, primarily a sort of research center at this point. Um, and we like to talk about what we do as work rather than research, um, a broader sort of frame. Um, and sometimes it involves research, um, inquiry, and sometimes it involves us learning rather than, um, than teaching people or um, and learning about how to live, how to be well, the quality of life sorts of questions. 
um, and doing it with, with folks, um, walking with folks in community. Um, so we yeah, dropped the research part, talk about work instead, collaborative work in particularly, um, and drop the city as this kind of theoretical frame and just um, went to cities. Uh, and that also reflected kind of a move out of Baltimore, still in Baltimore, but kind of like radiating and finding other sites, other cities. So we do a lot of work in Philly, LA, um, starting to do work in New Orleans, um, San Diego. So we've kind of expanded to a lot of different places. Uh, and so like that plural um, pluralization and also like making it a little bit more concrete, the context. Um, so pointing to, yeah, when we say um, cities, we mean this city, that city. So, and the same thing with like when we say community or communities, making it a little bit more concrete, like who are you talking about? Name people specifically. Um, in the past, in the first four years of the center, I thought of it as primarily like 501c3s, um, and so I could list out specific 501c3s that were communities to me that I worked with. Um, and now even that seems a little too broad, like I have to name specific people within those 501c3s and talk about this is the community that I work with. Um, so yeah, the, the name of the center is now um, the Center for Religion and Cities. That's great. I love getting to, to hear that narrative and kind of that journey. Um, so thinking about journeys as well, can you tell me a little bit about the time during the pandemic and what's the story of your project um, with the COVID-19 emergency grant? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I my, my, as I mentioned, my parents were um, originally from Central America and um, lost a lot in that move. Um, over and worked a lot from a place of scarcity. And so I, I grew up with a whole lot of scarcity around. Um, and it, was, it took me a minute to like, uh, we were working with students in the center on food access, for example. And I was like, yeah, this is important. This happens to people. And then like, it took me a bit. I was like, oh shit, this happened to me too. Like, I remember when my dad lost his job and the people at church were bringing cereal like for us to eat. And I like, those were like my, I loved it because we were getting all the good, like the good cereals, the really unhealthy ones, like Lucky Charms and the things that we couldn't afford. Um, so, like, I was operating the center in this this mode as well, this mode of scarcity, and I was doing a whole lot of different things. Um, with with uh, I, I was given some resources, and with those some resources, I was able to like multiply and amplify. Um, and so I, like, I knew that about myself and I knew that about a lot of the communities and community organizations that I work with, that they did a lot with very little. Um, and I was excited to kind of try to lean into doing less and more joyful things. Um, so leading up to the pandemic, we had organized the second conference, the first conference um, we had, at, or some, yeah, conference on religion and cities at Morgan. Um, and we were organizing a second one in which we were going to have more artists and more um, time for like just reflecting on things. Um, so like spacing things out, um, taking a beat, going a little bit slower, maybe even um, checking out our pace. Um, and then the pandemic happened and we had to cancel the, um, the conference. And that was really hard for me to do. Um, really, really hard. I waited for way too long. I should have canceled it earlier. Um, but I was then like, what do we do with these resources? What do we do with this funding? Um, and so we talked with our, our um, center folks, leadership. We reached out to our community partners. Um, and then we reached out to the Luce Foundation and asked if we could shift the funding that we had for um, the conference to um, helping to support folks that were doing direct aid. Um, and there was enthusiastic support for that. And so I was, I was pleasantly surprised because I know in the past that um, that was a, a restriction in terms of the funding and how it could be used um, to support direct aid. Um, so I, I got excited and did the thing and then was invited to like um, to, to, to do more of that. Um, so we received an additional grant, um, I think it's like $150,000 to do more of the, the dist redistribution of funds to community partners. Um, when we when we first reached out to our community partners, the first time to shift funding from the um, conference to, to the work that they were doing, um, one person in particular, Heber Brown uh, from the Black Church Food Security Network, was like, "This is great, but we could also use some help in terms of documents. We're like so busy um, doing the work that there's very little time to like document it and reflect on it." And so when I was talking to Jonathan Van Antwerpen, the program officer for Luce Foundation that we work with. Um, 
I, I shared some of this and it just was completely aligned with the kind of um, work that they were trying to support. Um, at the moment, all of a sudden, the restrictions in terms of supporting direct aid um, were lifted, but there was still this desire to do some kind of documentation and, and reflection on the work. Um, and so like we hired, uh, we, we took on the, the, the funding, and in addition to like providing um, a lot of support for um, I think over 10 different organizations, um, we, we hired a team, it was like a, almost 30 of us, of um, mostly um, students and graduate students and some contingent faculty whose jobs were impacted by the pandemic, by the, um, the restrictions and gathering. And so they, they were struggling financially as well. Um, and so we shifted some of the, or we like shaped some of the funding to support them um, and also bring them onto the team to help document and reflect on the work. Um, and this was very different for me. Like it was a, like a large scale sort of project in terms of the number of researchers, students, and folks working to document um, the work that was being done. Um, I learned a lot um, and it was really helpful to have a broader community of folks to, um, to kind of share with like, hey, we're thinking about doing this and um, so we, the Loose Foundation was also, with the help of PRI, um, ha having these like Zoom conversations with all of the PIs that were doing this kind of work at different centers in different places um, and with different frames. And we're like sharing a lot of resources and I would say like, yeah, I'm doing this thing. And we're like, yeah, um, that's cool. And also, have you thought of this, this, and this? Um, and I remember one person in particular, Teresa Smallwood, um, provided what she called covenants, like covenant agreements. Um, and I. I took that as a template and reshaped it a little bit um, to produce our grants agreements. And I like the frame, but we didn't end up keeping it. Um, but it was a, a helpful resource and tool in terms of um, other folks were thinking about um, a lot of other technical things that I hadn't even thought about. Um, and I, wish I shared some of the insights that I had um, to the group, and um, I, I hope it was helpful to them as well. But that was also a really powerful learning experience, um, both in terms of um, providing direct aid or supporting direct aid, um, but also in terms of managing a large team to uh, document and reflect on the work as well. Um, and I think like a lot of things could have been done better. Uh, I could have done a lot of things better, but it was nice to have the opportunity to do work that I thought was meaningful um, during a time where there was a lot of anxiety. Um, I felt it, a lot of other folks that I was working with felt it. Um, and so it was good to have that community as well. Um. Yeah, that sounds really powerful. Um, we've got about four more minutes in this little chat that we're having right now. But so I was wondering if you'd share a little bit about one of like your biggest successes. What's something you were really proud of, something that brought a lot of excitement um, over the course of that grant period? So um, we were fortunate enough to like to also have get additional um, support in subsequent years. And so we like there was um, Abel Gomez, one of our research fellows, um, did an op-ed and he was working with um, two indigenous communities in, in, uh, on the West Coast. Um, so in addition to getting the direct aid, he did oral history interviews with them and they were fantastic. And then he also um, did this op-ed that got published and it was amazing. It was really cool to read and help to edit and be a part of. Um, so super like excited and proud of that. Um, and a bunch of other little things like that, that, that um, um, publications that emerged, but um, little in terms of like in, an individual's contribution. Um, and then after that was over, we had an opportunity to kind of put all of those together into an exhibit. Um, and we also, so we got students involved in the curatorial process and having weekly meetings leading up to the installation. Um, working with um, staff at the museum, at the James E. Lewis Museum of Art at Morgan State University. Um, and then working with students to, to look at the oral history interviews that we had recorded, um, art students, visual art students, to then produce artworks um, that were displayed in the, in the, in the museum. Um, and then we had a closing reception, which was, we were kept trying to figure out different ways of trying to make it work, but there was still a lot of um, like social distancing restrictions. and. Nate Walker, who had been on the, um, the broader sort of conversations that we were having with the other loose folks, had some ideas and was able to do some things. I was like, oh, cool, like I'll do a, like a window exhibit or um, we'll do it this way. And, and he had had some successes. Um, 
and provided a lot of sort of um, possibilities, but ultimately it didn't work out for us. Um, and we ended up doing a, a Zoom a sort of conversation. And we created a website, a virtual sort of um, space for it as well for to like kind of go around those um, or provide an alternative um, uh, to, yeah. And that reception, it was a virtual closing reception. We had all of the different community partners who had received um, support from us, um, who had shared their stories um, with us about the work and the hardships that they were going through. They showed up and they talked a little bit about what their experience was like, um, what they were able to do with the support that, that was provided. Um, and that was a, like such a special night for me. And I, was, I remember I was in my office right at home <laughs> on my computer screen and people were, and I wanted to celebrate communally, but I was like alone and not, right? It was like this kind of interesting sort of thing that happened. But it was a very joyful and um, awe-inspiring experience for me to see everybody there um, collectively sharing things and the students also sharing about what they um, experienced throughout the process. The curatorial students shared, the art students shared, the community partners shared. Some of the researchers came back and shared a little bit. Um, and so we have the website and we have the, like, the reception recorded on the website. Um, it's bettingonhope.org and I think it's one of the, the proudest things that, that uh, I've had an opportunity to work on. Yeah, that sounds like a really beautiful moment of coming together. And I think, you know, a lot of people shared those moments, particularly during the pandemic of that moment of being in community, but still somehow being very alone and yeah. being very isolated. Um, but I think it was nurturing to folks to have those kind of celebratory moments. I think like another really important along those lines lesson that um, kind of came out for me was that like the, the Zoom, the sort of virtual gatherings were really helpful and important. Um, and I think like really helpful and important as like kind of interim in lieu of when we can't do this other thing. And so like thinking about the work of ac like the Academy broadly, and these are conversations that we've been having, like for example, with the American Academy of Religion for a long time about our like footprint in terms of like how, like how much like we're contributing to emissions when we travel to a conference. Um, something like 10,000 scholars going and descending into one city. Um, how we like, in, in lieu of that, what are some of the interim sort of ways that we can stay connected that take less, um, that have less of a negative impact on our environment. Um, and so like, I think the in-person sort of um, gatherings are, are very, very important. Um, but I think like we also like, you know, pointed the light on, on how, what impact it has on our environment and our, um, our, our, our sort of connected um, ways. And that there are other ways to kind of like connect, um, but that it, it is kind of, um, yeah, I think of it as in sort of um, in lieu of or uh, it, until we meet again it physically like in the physical space, um, that, that there is important things that can still happen. Yeah, like a, that both and moment, right? Yeah. We don't want just one or the other, but maybe maybe a new combination. Yeah, I like the both and. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, we'll stop the recording for now.